we're kicking off our series on Narnia. Now, how many of you have read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Raise your hand. How many of you have read the whole series? How many of you have seen the movie? Yeah, much more. Exactly. Because it's, it's easier than reading the book. We are jumping in. I love these stories. I love the Narnia stories. As a matter of fact, I still read them. And I want to start us off on this adventure by reading how the adventure starts, okay? So, as all the crinkling's happening and you'll get your fruits, I just see a bunch of bitter faces out there <laughs> that the children have fruit snacks and you do not. It's coming. I promise you, it's coming any minute. Here's how this story starts. There's four siblings, two boys and two girls, and they're walking through this really big house. And Lucy, is anybody named Lucy in this group here? Do we have any Lucys? Okay. All of a it's like, man, nope. I know a Lucy. Okay. Because I was going to let you walk through there and just see what happened. But we won't do that this morning. Lucy, she stays behind in this room and she sees a wardrobe, this kind of closet looking thing. And she stays behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door, even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. But to her surprise, it opened quite easily and two mothballs dropped out. Do we know what mothballs are? Yeah, ask her parents later. They're kind of a thing. All right. And looking inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly fur coats. And so she immediately stepped inside the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them. And then what do you think happened? She continued to push through. And as she pushed through into the wardrobe, she noticed that there was another layer of coats. And then she noticed that she was stepping on something that was a little bit crunchy. And she thought, is that a mothball? And she reached down and touched it, and it was cold. And then stuff rubbing against her face didn't feel like fur coats anymore. It felt like trees. And then it says, a moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. And she ended up in Narnia. And I love this story, and I love the fact that this story has this kind of secret door to another world. And I love secret door stories because I think it reminds us that there's more going on in the world than we can see. It reminds us that there's bigger adventures to be had. Now, let me ask you this question, and I'm going to want some answers so you can just raise your hand. If you could have a secret door in your house that led anywhere, where would you want that secret door to lead? All right. To my parents' house so I can make a bunch of pranks on them. Okay, so that you could prank your parents. Okay, so a little bit of something going on here. What do you think? Um, Narnia. You'd want to go to Narnia. That's fantastic. Can I ask my parents something, maybe? You just want a secret passage. Do your parents have doors into their rooms of the house, or do they have it totally blocked off? <laughs> Because that's what it sounds like. What do we think? New York. New York. <laughs> that's great. I don't want to forget about people over here. Does anybody have an answer? If you could have a secret door, okay. If I could have a secret door, I'll lead it to Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> What's up? All right. We'll come back. We'll come back. Now, that's great. I'll, I'll have another question in just a second. Now, we know that the door opened up to Narnia. It opened up into Narnia. Now, at this point in Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. And that kind of stinks. Now, in Narnia, there's a lot that's familiar, but there's a lot that's not familiar. And there's a lot of strange creatures in Narnia. There's minotaurs and unicorns and centaurs and fawns. And there's, there's talking animals that seem to be everywhere. How many of you have pets? Do you have pets? How many of you have a unicorn for a pet? Just a, just a couple of you? Okay. That's good. I have a question for you. If your pets could talk, what do you think they would say? Let me see some hands. If your pets could talk, what do you think they would say? Feed me. Feed me. <laughs> All day long. What else? Right here. What do you think your pet would say? Say thank you. Thank you? You have a very polite pet. Very nice. What do you think your pet would say? Leave me a note. I need a nap. I need a nap. Oh, okay. Because that's what your parents would say, too. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm just saying. What do you think your pets would say? Love me. Love me. Uh, Get me out of here. Get me out of here. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. 
All right, let me ask you one more question. If you, because I'll be honest, after the first time that I read the Narnia books, I went all through my house and pushed on all my closets. Did you guys do that? I went around and I just wanted to make sure if there's going to be a secret door somewhere. If you found in one of your closets that it opened up into another world, how many of you would adventurously just walk in and explore the land? Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting to me. Because here's the, here's the thing, church. As you look up here, this is not the church of tomorrow. This is the church. We... we are the church. And I hope you're blessed by looking at this church. And I hope that we understand what childlike wonder looks like. I hope that we understand how amazingly courageous these kids are. And before we go back to your seats, I want to pray blessing over you, okay? Will you guys pray with me? Will all of you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for these children. We thank you that we are a place here that is full of amazing children. And I pray that you would bless them with childlike wonder that lasts. That it would not leak away as they get older, but that wonder would stick with them. I pray that you would bless them with courage to explore and to go out into the world, into new places, and learn about your grace and truth. So we pray blessing over these children today in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming, guys. You can go back. And parents, you might need to wave because sometimes it gets hard to find where people are back there. And there's only a few fruit snacks left. We'll save them for later. Okay. I love that part. I love when we get to have the kids up on stage. I also love the sound of fruit snack wrappers. And realize that for the next five minutes, you could care less what I'm saying. Because you're eating. But we're going to keep going anyway. We're jumping into a Narnia series. And we're not jumping into a Narnia series for the sake of C.S. Lewis. He didn't write the Gospels. We're not jumping into this series because we ran out of good things to talk about. We're jumping into this series because these stories are great stories, but these stories are allegories. These stories are stories that will lead us to deeper truths. And so when we look at the stories of Narnia, we're going to find the gospel all throughout. And so we're just using these stories as a way to springboard us into deeper faith. C.S. Lewis called uh, these stories an imaginative welcome to the Christian faith. He said they open up joy and wonder. He said this, as a matter of fact, I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which had paralyzed much of my own religion in childhood. By casting all of these things, and he's talking about God and Jesus and biblical truth, into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations... One could make them, for the first time, appear in their real potency. The Narnia stories are just a different way to look at the gospel. They're just a different way to discover Jesus. And it's not just for kids. At the end of this article that he wrote, he said, The inhibitions which I hoped my stories would overcome in a child's mind may exist in a grown-up's mind as well, and may perhaps be overcome by the same means. So it means that as all of us kind of lean into these stories... Hopefully we will see the gospel. Hopefully we will see Jesus in a new way. And that's what we want to do here this morning. If you're unfamiliar with the story, Aslan is the lion. He's the Jesus figure. He's the hero of the story. There is a white witch. She's oppressing the land. She's the one keeping it winter and never allowing Christmas to happen. And then there's four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And they find their way into the wardrobe and then into Narnia. Now this morning we're going to focus on Edmund. Edmund is not the hero of this story. Edmund, however, is the most developed character in all of the stories. And Edmund's life has very much in common with our lives. And it's through Edmund that we see the redemptive love and sacrifice of Jesus. We are Edmund in this story, and we're going to carry that through. Now, there's a lot of themes that we could lean in on, but as I did some listening prayer about this, I just kept hearing this word redemption. Ephesians 1, 7. It says, God is so rich in kindness and grace 
that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. God's kindness and grace are overflowing. They're abundant. And because of that, he has purchased our freedom. Now, did we need our freedom purchased? Yes, because we had sold ourselves into slavery. We had sold ourselves into slavery to sin, and we needed someone to come and redeem us, to buy us back. And that's just what that means. Literally, it's saying we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus because of his sacrifice. Redeem is a term that we see in Scripture again and again, and it means payment of a price to liberate one from the power of another to clear a debt, and it indicates an intentional choice, like I'm doing this on purpose. In the Old Testament, there's no bankruptcy laws. What it means is, if you got yourself into debt, let's say you made some poor choices, or there was famine in the land, or something happened in your family, and and you needed something to survive, if you got yourself into debt, then you had to sell your possessions to clear that debt. If you didn't have enough possessions to sell, you've sold everything, then you yourself would have to go, and oftentimes your family would have to go to work off that debt. And sometimes that would take a year or two, and sometimes that would be the rest of your life. And so you could accumulate a debt that would put you into slavery. Now this term then transitioned to the New Testament to say that we have been indebted to sin. And it's a debt that we can never work off. There's not enough work that we can do to pay this debt, and we need someone who will come in and redeem us. And so we're going to look at the redemption story in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Now, like I said, we're Edmund. We're Edmund in this story. Edmund is described as spiteful, prideful, mean-spirited, jealous, and self-serving. You're welcome. (laughs) You might be there going, well, that perfectly describes my neighbor, Or you might be saying, I didn't know we were talking about Steve Fowler today. (laughs) Remember last week when Steve preached and he was like, you can say what you want. I'm getting on a plane and leaving. I just did. (laughs) That's Edmund. That's who he is. He's prideful. He's self-serving. He gets through the wardrobe at one point. And he ends up in Narnia by himself. And he's been there for like three minutes. And he runs into the white witch. And she gives him a little bit of food. She gives him some snack food, some Turkish delight, which isn't really that great anyway. But he gets this snack food, and then she says, you know, talks about his brothers, and then she tells him, you know what? I'll make you king of this whole place if you'll betray your brother and sisters to me. And he's like, sure. (laughs) I'll do it. I'm in. That's this this pride, this self-serving This jealousy that he's experiencing. And so he's in for three minutes and all of a sudden he's betrayed his family for this this queen of Narnia. Now later on when all four of the children get through the wardrobe, they're having a lovely meal with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver like you do. And Edmund turns up missing. And the book says this, Mr. Beaver then said what the other three knew in their hearts to be true. He's gone to her, the white witch. He has betrayed us all. Edmund betrayed them, and he was finding his way to the White Witch. And the interesting thing is, as he goes there, he's thinking, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be so great. She's going to love me. I'm going to rule. And when he gets there, she treats him disdainfully. It's not the welcome that he was expecting. As a matter of fact, he ends up becoming her slave. The very thing that he thought was going to bring him joy, the very thing that he thought was going to bring him freedom, the life that he wanted, he went from awesome to awful because she enslaved him. And this is our story as well. You see, our pride, our selfishness, our desire to rule our own lives takes us to places, puts us underneath certain things that we think are going to give us freedom but end up enslaving us. Romans chapter 6 says this, Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. We become slaves to the things that we obey. And quite honestly, a lot of times we obey the wrong things and we become their slaves. We think that freedom will come from our job. We think freedom will come from knowledge or a relationship 
or possessions. And so we give ourselves to those things, thinking that freedom is found there, only to find out that we become enslaved to them. And we know that we're enslaved to them when we can't say no. When we can't say no to these things, when our identity and our security is so wrapped up in these things, whether it's a job, relationship, possession, that we can't say no. And so we end up growing up as slaves. And at times, quite honestly, we've all obeyed our selfish desire at the expense of the principles of God. We've tried to put ourselves on the throne and we've ended up in slavery. And that's called sin. And the Bible says that we all sin. And we're just walking through the gospel here. It's Edmund's story. It's our story. Romans chapter 3. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. We've all done it. We've all tried to do our own thing. And the consequence of this sin, you see, what happens is, is it's a broken relationship. We break relationship with God when we strike out on our own. God gave us his principles. God gave us his commands in the form of a covenant. And that means relationship. God did not give us all of these things so that we could just mindlessly obey because God was like, they're going to need a bunch of stuff to do. So I'm going to give them a bunch of like commands to keep them busy. They'll stay out of trouble. God gave us his principles in scripture because they're the foundation and basis of our relationship with him. It's what allows us to have relationship with him. It's what allows us to have true freedom. We don't really understand that all the time, but true freedom is found when we're under the rule of God. And so he gave us these things that when we break these principles, when we step aside, as all of us have done, it breaks down that relationship. And the eventual outcome of that is death. Separation from God is death. Romans chapter 6. The wages of sin, the penalty of sin is death. And this is what happens to Edmund in the story. Edmund gets into Narnia. He gets in with the white witch. He thinks this is where he wants to be. He thinks this is freedom. And so he gives himself to her and he betrays everything else. And then she enslaves him. And then death is the result. In the book, she is in front of Aslan, the white witch. And she says, you know... Every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery, I have a right to kill. He is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. Because that's the way it worked. Now, the other children rush to Aslan, and they say, we'll we'll change it. Change the way it works. Talk to the guy who made the law in the first place and make it different, and Aslan says that he can't. And you know what? We can have that same response. If we step back a minute, we can have that same response to sin. Like, God, just dismiss it. Like Aslan, just tell Edmund, okay, it's, it's over. Don't worry about it. I mean, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be sky. And there was sky. God said, let there be avocados so we could have guacamole. And it was so... So why couldn't God just say, let there be forgiveness without having a debt to be paid? Why couldn't God just have done that? Let there be forgiveness. There's no more debt to be paid. Here's the reason. Because God is perfectly loving and he's perfectly just. Now, here's the thing. He's perfectly loving. He is 100% love, which means he loves you with an everlasting love. And you might have this picture in your head. But, well, the God I can see in my head, he's angry. And and that's okay, because you know what? Anger and love go hand in hand. When you become a parent, you realize that you can love someone with an everlasting love and still be angry at them at the same time. Because they're doing things that are hurting themselves and hurting everybody else around, and so your love for them causes you to be angry. And that's okay. You see, anger is not the opposite of love. Indifference is the opposite of love. Anger means you're invested. And so, yes, sometimes God is angry, but he is 100% love. He's also 100% just, which means that when there is something wrong, when we sin, when we go against his principles, when we break the commands of God, we begin to accumulate a debt. And God's justice can't just dismiss the debt. 
A debt has to be paid. Someone has to pay the price of that. That's because God is 100% just. We could also step back and we could go, well, but what's the big deal? I, I grew up in church. I spent almost my entire life in church. And I wrestled with this because I saw what other people were doing and it was worse than what I was doing. And I tended to minimize my own sin. Well, I haven't done anything awful. I mean, I've read stories about like Hitler. That was awful. And I haven't done anything that, like that. Couldn't God be like, well, that's just not a big deal. You're fine. But here's the thing. Kids, what is this? It's an acorn. If you can't see it way back there. This is an acorn. Within this acorn is the power to fill the entire world with wood. Because you could plant this one acorn and an oak tree could grow and then you'd have more acorns and you could plant those and more. And eventually you could fill the whole world with wood from this one acorn. And oftentimes, you know, this, this is sin too. Because when sin goes unchecked, when our jealousy and when our pride and when our self-serving goes unchecked, it fills the whole earth with destruction. And we may think of our sin just as little acorns, but we need to see them as, as serious. We need to see them honestly as capital offenses because if we don't see our sin as a big deal, then we'll never see the cross as a big deal. If we don't see our sin as a capital offense, we'll never understand the beauty and the sacrifice of the cross. If we think uh, my sin's no big deal, it's like saying ah, the cross is no big deal either. And I'm not trying to depress everybody here, but that's the truth. Sin is a big deal. It's a capital offense. It enslaves us, and we need redemption. And that's where Edmund ended up in the story. Edmund ended up, the witch had a knife, and she was going to take his life for the penalty of his sin. Now, into this situation steps Aslan. And I love it. And quite honestly, I've learned a lot from the portrayal of Aslan in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, in all of the Narnia stories. For just a minute, close your eyes. Don't nod off on me. I want you to picture God. If you have a picture of God, picture God in your head for just a minute. I don't know when you pray if you do this or, you know, we don't really know what God looks like, but maybe you have this idea. You have that picture? Okay, open your eyes so you don't nod off. Did he have gray hair? that was always kind of blowing, but there was really no wind? Was he wearing a robe? Big white robe that was glowing. Did he have sandals on the size of Texas? Just this really big guy. And I don't know, maybe that's your picture. Maybe your picture of God, oftentimes it's like grandpa. You know, the guy who, who really has a lot of great advice for you, and every once in a while he gives you a dollar. And you're like, that's awesome. And so maybe that's your picture of who God is. Maybe Mr. Rogers. You know, this unfailingly nice. But now put yourself in this situation. What if you're walking in a strange city? And you think you know where you're going. It's a big city and you're walking and you make one wrong turn and another wrong turn. And and then all of a sudden you end up and there's this alley, this typical alley that you've always seen in every movie about the city and there's dumpsters and and fire escapes and waters dripping and then all of a sudden as you're walking down this alley you hear shuffling feet and you're really really scared who do you want with you in that moment grandpa mr rogers no we we want aslan We want the lion. We want the ferocity. I think Daniel in the lion's den didn't want Mr. Rogers. Neither did Moses in front of Pharaoh. Neither did David with Goliath. And I love the description of of Jesus, basically, in this book. It says he was a ferocious thunderstorm and a kitten. It's hard to imagine something so terrible and good at the same time. The quote that people love is from Mr. Beaver. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's Jesus. 
And only Jesus could step into this situation and rescue us. He's gentle when we have hurt and pain, and he's ferocious in the dark alleys of our lives. He's loving and fierce enough to deal with what we're going through. And so Aslan steps into the mess. He steps into the mess of Edmund's life. Edmund's life was forfeit. The witch had a rightful claim and she knows it. And she says, unless a sacrifice is made, as the law says, all of Narnia will perish in fire and water. And so Aslan settles the matter by becoming a sacrifice in his place. And quite honestly, it's my most favorite and least favorite part of the book. I read it just about a month ago, kind of familiarized myself with it. I got to that part where Aslan was getting killed and I had to close the book and I put it away. And then like three days later, I brought it out again and I skipped past it and wanted to read. And then I thought, oh, I need to read this part because it's so important. So I read through it. I don't know if you've ever watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ. It's brutal. It's a hard movie, but it's important. That's what Jesus did. Jesus sacrificed himself. He stood in our place so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be bought back, so that we could live free. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, God made Christ who never sinned, that's what made him the perfect sacrifice, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Jesus gave his life. He was punished for us in our place because we could never repay the debt. He went through horrible physical pain and he also went through spiritual pain. You see, to bear the weight of that sin meant separation from his father. And it's interesting, over the past week or so, I've looked at all the prayers of Jesus in the New Testament and they all begin with father. Father, this term of intimacy, this term of relationship, this term of connection, except for the one prayer when he's on the cross. And he prays, God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you left me in this moment? And I believe for that moment, Jesus felt in his heart what it was like to be separated from his father for eternity. That was part of the weight of that sin that he bore for us. He got treated as if he was us so that we could be treated as if we were him. John Stott says it this way. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Jesus took our place. He left heaven, became man, so that he could be the sacrifice for us. I've been reading a book this past week and in it, just this little quote, it says, God's majesty is not as important to him as his children. So what's that say about how much God loves us? What's that say about our identity? You see, in the first half of this story, us being like Edmund stinks. That's horrible. I don't want that. But in the second half of this story, us being like Edmund is amazing. Because in the story, Aslan, who gets killed, rises again. Because he's the Christ figure. Jesus, who dies on the cross, is resurrected. And that should bring us joy. You know when we sing that song, Death Was Arrested, and we get to that part that, you know, it looks like darkness had won, but Jesus arose, and something in us just stirs, and we all want to jump up and down and cheer? Because that means our freedom. That's what Jesus did for us. Titus 2.14. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. To make us his people. That's what Jesus did. Edmund had a debt he couldn't pay. Aslan stepped in and gave his life so that Edmund could live. We had a debt that there was no way we could repay. And thankfully, we wouldn't have to spend the rest of our lives trying to repay this debt. Because we could never work it off. Christ stepped in and sacrificed himself for us so that we could be free. Redemption means this. It means forgiveness. It means freedom from the slavery of sin. It means adoption into God's family. It means peace with God. It means the indwelling Holy Spirit and eternal life. 
Edmund's story is our story. When we put our faith in Christ, that's the redemption that we receive. Edmund went from rebellion to righteousness to royalty, from a slave to the witch to a son of the king. That's the gospel message. I want to give us just a couple things to hang on to in the coming weeks. Just a couple handles. First is this. Worship the gentle and fierce God. Think of the moments in your life where God was completely gentle in your hurt and your pain. And think of the times that he was completely fierce. And maybe have these conversations over lunch today. What was one time that you saw God be just fierce for you in the dark alley of your life? And spend time worshiping him for that redemption. The second thing is this. Tell your story of redemption. Psalm 107 says this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. Now, in the original Hebrew, this verse means, has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. Just, it's the same thing. What it means is we need to tell our story of redemption. That's what that means. And here's why. Because a lot of people will never read the gospel account. A lot of people will never read the Narnia story. But you're in a unique position to speak your story to them. And maybe that's the first time that they hear of the redeeming love of Jesus. Just speak what God has done in your life. If God has redeemed us, we need to tell our stories. And lastly is this. We need to respond to the gospel. I know a lot of you have already responded to the gospel. I know a lot of you in this room are walking in freedom because of what Christ has done in your lives. But maybe you came in to this place this morning and you've never really thought your sin was that big of a deal. You never really thought your sin was a capital offense worthy of death. Maybe you never even thought that Jesus noticed. But we have to respond to what we know. We have to respond to his sacrifice. We have to make a decision. And, and no decision is still making a decision. And so I would call you to decision today. If this is you, you know, sometimes when we tell children this, we say it's just as simple as ABC. We acknowledge our sin. We admit that we have sinned. That's the A. The B is that we believe Christ is God's sin and he died for us. And the C is we commit our life to him. And if you feel like you have just been enslaved by all of these things in your life and you are yearning for freedom, it's as simple as ABC. Christ wants us to walk in that freedom. The worship team is going to come out. They're going to close with a song. But I want to let you know, at the end of every service, we always say the cross is open. The cross is a place for you to come and to commit your life to Christ. There'll be people by the cross who would love to have this conversation with you. There'll be people here at the last song. And children, if you're in the room and you've yet to make this commitment, but you feel something stirring in your heart, lead the way. I love that children get to be in the room oftentimes because they, they lead and adults get to follow that example. Adults, if you're in the room and you just feel that stirring and you want to make that decision, there'll be people by the cross. Respond to the love, the everlasting love of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thanks for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the truth in it. We confess that we have rebelled. That we are Edmund, that we've been prideful and self-serving. But Jesus, we praise you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the freedom in the room because of what you've done, Jesus. And I just pray that you would stir in hearts who don't yet know you, that they would lean into who you are. In your name, Jesus, amen.